Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, Adobe blames some security researchers for their own stupid mistakes. We'll give you the details. We'll also tell you about a tool that you can use to passively monitor all of the people connected to your network and learn all kinds of interesting details about them. Plus, we'll explain exactly how SQL injections work. All that and more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi, everyone, and welcome to TechSnap. This is Jupiter Broadcasting Systems Network and Administration Podcast. This is our 40th episode, and we streamed it live on Thursday, January 12th. And get ready for this for release on January, Friday, the 13th, 2012. This episode is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. And I'll tell you more about them as the show goes on. And the live stream is provided by ScaleEngine.com, which is awesome. My name is Chris, and joining me like every single week is the tech, the admin, and the teacher, Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris. Hey, hey everybody. man. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome back to the show. So 40 of these in a row. So that means yes. 40 consecutive weeks you and I have been sitting here doing this. Yes. <laughs> And you know it's going to get even more crazy as it gets to fifty, but that's all yeah. right. Uh, so we got a we got a we got a big show, lots of stuff loaded up in the news segment, and then in the roundup, uh, we've got a pretty interesting roundup. I think one of our more interesting ones that we've had for a, a while, including some it's just uh, huge and has some follow ups and some yeah, big news. And yeah, yeah, and and we also have a great Q and A segment that we'll get to uh, as the mm -hmm. show goes on. Alan, is there uh, anything you want to cover at the top of the show, or should we jump right into our first news story? Um, not much. Okay. Really. All right. You know what? I'll just give a quick mention of the uh, the TechSnap subreddit. Go to links.techsnap.tv, and that's a great place to submit stories for the show or vote them up or down, depending on how you like them. And then we use that to sort of weigh which one should be included in the show. Oftentimes, the roundup is powered extensively from the TechSnap subreddit, so always thank you guys for that. And also, yes. I might as well give it a mention. You can send in questions to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com. If you've got like a sysadmin question, an implementation question, a technology question, or like a question that we're going to cover uh, later in the show, which are always great, uh, send those yep. in techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com. All right, dude. Well, why don't we go to our first story, which involves like a really old zero-day exploit from Adobe, right? Kind of. Yeah. Kind of? Is it like an exploit of an old exploit again? It's like come back again to bite them in the butt? <laughs> it's not entirely clear. Okay. If, yeah, it's, it's zero day, so nobody knew about it until just now. All uh, right. So there's a zero day vulnerability in Adobe Reader. I, oh, I imagine surprise, that surprise. news headline has happened more times than TechSnap. I mean, do you almost, when you're, <laughs> when you're looking at it, do you almost wonder, is this an old story or is this a new one? Because I do. I, like, I look at it and I go, I wonder right. if this yeah, is I a always, repeat. I always check the date. <laughs> yeah, you have to because they happen so often. <laughs> yeah. But again, okay, so that's because, you know, it happens to be installed on, you know, every Windows machine at every business. Yeah, right? true that, true that, true that. And yep. those tend to be, the, and also the people that tend to use it are the same people that tend to not update it as much. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there was a vulnerability and it was used, uh, it was specifically targeted at defense contractors this time though. Oh, That's uh, one of the things that makes it big. So, uh, an extremely targeted attack was carried out against uh, a bunch of major players in the defense industry uh, using what was previously an unknown zero-day exploit uh, for Adobe Reader. Hmm. Well, uh, you know, we've mentioned before on the show that contractors are specifically a good target to go after. So, mm -hmm. not too surprising that they would focus on somebody like a defense contractor. Yeah. So, only about 20 or so machines were ever targeted in this attack. Uh, but the, those 20 were spread across a number of different companies. Huh. So that's pretty uh, targeted. Yeah. And uh, so basically a specially crafted PDF file uh, that exploited this vulnerability and executed code on the victim's computer was sent to a very specific list of email addresses. Uh, rather than typically, you know, your phishing style attack or whatever, you just spam it to everybody you can get and hoping to get as many people as you can. Sure, sure. Uh, this one was specifically targeted at only a few people likely in the hope that the zero-day exploit wouldn't be discovered, right? If you spam everybody, then the virus, antivirus people are mm. going to get copies of your virus and right. be able to figure out how it works. Right. But by targeting very, very few people, it means that you can likely keep that zero days a secret to keep using it for longer. Right, much like uh, how the zero-day exploits that uh, we know that Stuxnet take advantage of were ones that had been around for a while, but people kept close to the chest because as the vulnerability is more, um, some, well, let's just say some vulnerabilities are more valuable than other vulnerabilities. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so and, and, then, and then once they're publicized, they're much harder to 
to exploit because eventually a patch comes out. Right, yeah. And so if you can keep the zero day a, a secret, then you can keep exploiting it for a long time. Right. And that is why <laughs> that that is why the security policy of full disclosure of disclosing these exploits as soon as you find them uh, is that's why it exists because by exposing them you make them harder to pull off. Sure. Right, right? that you, you you ensure you force the comp- the vendors to try to seal them up as quickly as they can. Well, otherwise, you're either intentionally or not, you're relying on security from obscurity and just hoping, yeah. or you just relying that nobody else finds it. Yes, because oh, if yeah. you found it, well, how do you not know that somebody found it already before you, right? Because right. even when you're the kind of person that's out there researching and finding security vulnerabilities, you're usually not, not naive, but um, I don't know, egotistical enough to think that no one out there is smarter than you to have found it first. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, you announce it so that you, you know, you get spoil credit. their day. You get credit. Well, you get, yes, credit, you get credit, which as for a security just, researcher is a great way to promote yeah, your career. Exactly. So, I mean, there is, there, is, there is just as much motivation to disclose as there is to keep it secret. It just depends on yeah. which person and what and, color yeah, they have to wear. And there's basically two policies. The one is that you contact the vendor that's vulnerable and work with them and give them so much time to make a patch to come out before you announce the vulnerability Mm -hmm. so that if nobody has found it before there's no window where there's the vulnerability is known but the fix isn't uh but sometimes you have to just release it otherwise the company will just keep stalling forever to avoid having to do the work so do you know was do you know was there anything particular they were trying to take advantage of this adobe exploit to do like were they trying to get uh, access to really they were just uh the payload on the pdf was just the Psychopot Trojan. Uh, really so they were just putting a, a Trojan on the machines to gain oh, okay. access to sensitive materials or whatever. Yeah. So that uh, way they could get access yeah. as they please. It, it, like, it seems like either industrial espionage or state-sponsored espionage in this case because when you're targeting defense contractors, that's usually the reason why. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then from analysis of the exploit, which I've linked to, it appears that the exploit is based on a proof of concept uh, written by a researcher back in 2009. And this research was published uh, in 2009. <laughs> and had a CVE number and everything. Oh, uh, yeah. so, so that kind of raises the question, if the exploit is, is based off research in, that was published in 2009, why wasn't it fixed already? Or it's not, it's not clear whether that exploit was disclosed and then fixed, and this is just a derivative of it, that found, you know, a secondary exploit or a vulnerability in the fix. Right. Where, you know, uh, we saw this with Apache a couple of weeks ago. They issued a fix for a, a, an exploit, and by looking at the fix for it, somebody said, well, hey, there's this one case where you can right. still exploit it because you didn't fix it well enough. Right, right. So it could so be the fix wasn't th- this, a full this fix. This is where the, the old vulnerability comes from, right? This vulnerability uh, of using UD, or U3D in... Uh, PDF files has been known since 2009. It's just not clear whether it wasn't fixed in 2009 or if it was fixed but not well enough. Hmm. You know, it's kind of surprising though because uh, you almost you almost wish Adobe. Again, I know I've said this before, but I almost wish there was some sort of legal implication for not fixing their software that's so widely dependent on uh, yeah. properly. But uh, I guess the flip side is, is by not using a new exploit, in a lot of cases, it's easier for, for the first responders who it be either, you know, uh, t- uh, IT security or Adobe themselves. It should, in theory, be easier to fix, track down, and get repaired faster than something that's entirely new, I would guess. Possibly, yeah. yeah. So there, there uh, might be a silver lining there. Yeah, and so uh, one of the executives from Adobe made a point of reminding security researchers that when they publicly disclose their proof of concepts in the research, it's basically free R and D for cyber criminals. <laughs> right? It's like you're doing your jo- their job for them. Uh, but TechSnap would like to remind Adobe that the point of publicly disclosing such research is that it's free R and D for Adobe. Yes, that's what like, I was thinking. You, you should have found these vulnerabilities in your own software or not had them in the first place. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome, by the way. You're welcome that now this yes. has been done so, for you. you know, the, the reason why these uh, vulnerabilities are disclosed other than for personal gain by the person who discovered it to promote their career and their abilities as a security researcher is A, to help Adobe identify what the problem is so they can fix it and also to force Adobe to fix it. Right, because yeah. if the security researcher just found it and wasn't going to publish it, uh, Adobe would have no reason to go out and fix it. 
and there's but a middle ground, the right? You could, you could, if if Adobe was open to communications, you could contact Adobe and say, "Hey, I found yes. this. You've got three I don't know, months, you've got, you've whatever, got fifteen days, it. three yeah. weeks, two months, whatever to fix it, and then I'm going to disclose it, regardless yes. of fixed or not." And that's and that's what most uh, security researchers do. Yeah. Well, Adobe uh, sits in the privileged position of probably having that happen all the time. So you would think they do have some sort of official, ch- you know, communications channel for people to reach them and, and get in touch. So, yeah, so I, I'm not sure how this old 2009 vulnerability was exploited again. Either yeah. it is uh, a derivative, Negligence. not the same, or they totally missed yeah. uh, a fix that, they, that was published and they should have been all over it. Now, uh, didn't we have some previous coverage on some PDF exploits and things like that? Yeah, uh, this was based on uh, stuff we talked about on episode 35, because okay. that's when the vulnerability was discovered. Uh, Oct- uh, December 6 is when this vulnerability was announced by Adobe. They confirmed oh, okay. that it actually existed. Uh, but the patch didn't come out until January 10th, which is just on Tuesday. Uh, so... We, now that we have more details, and as a reminder for people to go and patch Adobe Reader if they have it on their system, because mm. this includes Adobe Reader for Unix, uh, is also vulnerable. Um, and so that's mostly why it's brought up. And the other thing is that the vulnerability was apparently reported to Adobe by Lockheed Martin uh, <laughs> after they had discovered it had been used against them. Oh, interesting. No, no more word on that, like what no, it was used. Uh, okay. uh, no. Adobe didn't deny that no. it was disclosed to them by Lockheed Martin, but, you know, they didn't say otherwise either. It's never like, um, you know, the, uh, the salami factory down the street that gets the exploit that they have to tell Adobe about. It's always like Lockheed Market, Martin or Department of Fans or Boeing, you know? It's, why can't it be my well, local butcher targets, who's got a Windows right? XP box? Why, why can't it be that guy? <laughs> it probably is him, too. He just doesn't know it. Yeah. Uh, Alan, any, any other thoughts on that story? Should we move on? Uh, no, I think we're ready for the next one. All right, let's talk about this next story. I have a particular interest in this one. One of the interesting and valuable tools out there is something called OS fingerprinting, where you can, usually by detecting like the network traffic and things like that, or by analyzing in some certain way, figure out what host operating system runs on a computer, which is always a great starting point uh, Starting point to then leap off to start trying different exploits against it. Right, and, and there's a library for that built into Nmap, which I think you're going to cover in an episode of In-Depth Look. Oh, you are, yes, I am. Uh, Saturday's episode episode of an in-depth look i'm going to release an episode called port scanning for fun and uh th- i've got uh basically three different sections in there using nmap to audit yourself to make sure that you're not like you know leaking anything you don't expect using nmap to audit your home network to see if there's any devices you're not expecting and then also using nmap remotely to scan your incoming network um and but that's a little different than what you're about to talk about right oh uh, right but uh, one of the features of Nmap is while doing the port scan, by looking at ports that are open and closed and filtered and so yeah, forth, yeah. it can uh, use the different way different OSs respond to that to right. fingerprint them and decide what kind of OS right. it is. Right. That's a now, very good tool. Yes. Now, this tool called P0F uh, is a network fingerprinting tool that's designed just to do that. Yeah. Uh, what, what it's designed to do is listen passively to all the traffic coming into your machine and a fingerprint all the different traffic. I like uh, that. So, unlike Nmap, which is active tracking, right? It's going out and making a connection to the machine Probing. and eliciting a response and, and interpreting that, uh, POF is actually passive. It's just listening to the traffic as it goes by and, and looking for characteristics in it. That's good, so not as detectable. Or not right. detectable. Uh, so it allows you to detect uh, information about the people that are connecting to you mm-hmm. rather than uh, Nmap, which is going out and poking them and seeing what they say. And they have a new version they've released too, right? Yes. So uh, the reason this is in the news is they have a, a brand new version that has a lot of uh, additional features. Uh, so the, the tool passively analyzes incoming network transmissions and determines uh, the operating system and a bunch of other information about the remote machine with a fairly high degree of accuracy. Uh, like the uh, Nmap one, depending on how many ports are open and in the different states, it Sometimes isn't that accurate, uh, but this one's a bit better. But it's specifically designed for the job, so that's you know. Yeah, this is. I gotta say, Alan, I, this is a tool I've got to definitely play with. I've always yeah. used the more uh, in-your-face type of OS fingerprinting, like uh, mm-hmm. you know, Nmap. This is uh, yeah. 
I, again, this is great because just by using a tool like this, you can kind of get, you can sometimes get very specific version information. In fact, yep. there's versions of Windows that specifically send data in a specific order, and you can actually figure out exactly what version it is by just watching that. And then you can yep. kind of get, you, like you can tell, for example, you can tell a Windows 2000 box that has Service Pack 1 versus one that has Service Pack 4 or whatever, based yep. on some of this stuff. And then you know what vulnerabilities it has just by looking at that. Exactly. Or at least have uh, a good idea. Or you could do the same thing for machines that are connecting into you. So if a machine happens to be a version that you know is vulnerable, you could reject the connection, assuming that that machine has already been compromised and it's connecting to you huh. in order to do you harm. So like, a, like use it as a screener to make sure that... Uh, yeah. It's not I, I, I'm sure exactly. Uh, because it, I don't know how long it takes to fingerprint stuff to know how useful it would be for that. Uh, but a bunch of the things I talk about here are... Uh, based on that idea, or or uh, how about this? What about this? If you had, um, if you if you had a Unix box that you SSH to, and you only ever SSH from it from another Unix box, you could reject all non Unix connections for over SSH or something like that too. I'd right, like, and then be like, hey, no Windows XP boxes allowed because yeah, yeah. Windows XP boxes are usually just infected machines that are hammering on my SSH server. <laughs> uh, so another feature of note is the newly rewritten version is able to. Uh, detect certain types of forgery. Uh, oh, really? So, so when things like Nmap are trying to pretend to be a different operating system, uh, it can detect that sometimes. Hmm. And so alerting you that the remote machine uh, isn't who they're claiming to be. Uh, the other thing is that it gained the ability to analyze some application layer protocols such as HTTP. So if you have this set up on your web server uh, and you're analyzing incoming connections, it can tell uh, sometimes when there's user agent forging going on. Uh, so, you know, if the... Who needs super cookies, right? Who needs... This is the right, ultimate well, form no, this, of potential This is tracking. more of like, if it's a spam bot who's pretending to, run, oh. to be running Internet Explorer 7, but is actually running, you know, Java spammer... It seems like something machine. like this, though, must have a decent CPU overhead, so you wouldn't really be able to run it on, like, a really busy server. Right, well, it depends, but again, if, if, well, if you're doing it as a firewall in front of a busy site, you probably have a sure. dedicated machine, sure. or it's you know, on the firewall, not on the web server, hmm. yeah. and, and block stuff ahead of time. Right? Uh, yeah. it's basically, it could, it could form a very fancy um, intrusion detection system. Uh, but also, it's able to detect a lot of other aspects of the connection, uh, such as if the connection involves NAT, uh, or if it was sent out over load balancing NAT, and so on. Uh, if it was a PPPoE connection, which is common for DSL, yeah. Uh, if the connection involves a VPN, hmm. uh, in, and uh, or was it a transparent or other type of irregular proxy, or even if the user was using Tor. Oh, interesting. You know, I guess it's it. All of this is just discernible by by carefully monitoring the data packets. Well, part of it is like for for the PPPoE one for DSL, uh, because there's that extra layer of wrapping going on the MTU size is slightly smaller because there's that extra set of headers that get stripped before the packet gets to the end user. So when I'm receiving information, I can say, all right, the MTU on this is a little bit smaller than the average uh, because it was over a DSL connection that has that extra layer of encapsulation. Am I jumping ahead by reading uh, the uh, uh, Release 3 candidate stuff here? Nope, where that's, he, that's, that's he talks version. about being able to measure... Uh, Systems network uptime. He talks about being able to automatically map a network just by watching the packets. And I mean, this right. is like, pretty so, cool. Uh, if if you're seeing a bunch of different connections from the same host, uh, but it's a NAT, uh, you can actually start to determine s how many separate machines are behind that NAT coming in to talk to you. <laughs> oh man! I mean, just think about some of the data Facebook can collect by corporate visitors who come to them. I mean, face because you know one of the problems right. you always say is, well, when I when you come from a big corporation, it's only one IP. But if they use tools like this, well, normally, uh, if they have enough things, it's more than one IP. Uh, it'll yeah, be load yeah, balanced sure, across sure, a couple yeah, IPs. Sure, yeah, but yeah. again, this detects that and can stitch them back together because when they're different IPs, it can look like it's different hosts. But if it's a bunch of different sequential IPs, right? Uh, and the you're looking at things like the uptime on the machine because uh, the uptime on the machine is used as one of the counters for TCP IP unless you have something like FreeBSD that has an option to randomize those so that they're not in order. Uh, but again, it allows you to tell. But 
that that whole uh, being able to tell the uptime from the response packet, that is how Netcraft monitors the uptimes of servers uh, for their web server survey. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. I'm familiar with that. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so because it's able to do a bunch of things like this, it could also be very useful for scrub, uh, fraud screening purposes for like an e-commerce site. Right, you could detect when the users, you know, using a VPN or a proxy to try to hide their IP address, or, you know, uh, when they're lying about their browser and, and a bunch of things like that. Uh, so you could then flag the order, saying this one looks suspicious; it needs a more investigation before we accept this credit card. Mm -hmm. uh, it could also, you know, be used as part of a firewall or a man in the middle attack, or as uh, by government to detect technologies like VPN and then block them. Yeah, that's what I was worried about. It's being used nefariously. I don't like that. Like, uh, imagine the idea of uh, you're pretending to be the free Wi-Fi at a hotel or at a coffee shop. You could then use this to detect when somebody's trying to do a VPN and block it. And if people really want their email and their VPN won't work, they'll be like, ah, screw it. I'll go on it without the VPN, right? Yeah. And Unfortunately. then unencrypted email. Yeah. Um, or Or you could use it you you could use it potentially to try to uh, prevent people from bypassing blocks. Like we have viewers who have to use VPNs to get around things like Hulu blocking in their country and stuff like that. And you know, the the whole idea has always been well, you know, you you cr you you shut down one VPN service and five more will spring up. But if you if you're able to block just at a fundamental data packet level the use of VPN, yep. uh, then it's sort of a different game all of a sudden. Yep. Mm. Don't I don't like that so much. Uh, any other thoughts on that one? Uh, not really. Just that it's a, a really interesting tool that yeah. I will definitely be playing with. Yeah, and uh, definitely go over to uh, jupiterbroadcasting.com on Saturday to check out my in-depth look on having fun with port scanning. <laughs> I, uh, you know, the Nmap, the Nmap guys just released a new version of Nmap, and it's only it's an alpha, but it is so slick, dude. It, inclu it includes like scripts. So say you Nmap a box and you discover that it's running like the Bitcoin miner. You can then, there's scripts that Nmap can then execute to query the Bitcoin miner about its information, about how many nodes it knows. There's lots uh -huh. of neat things they're building into Nmap now, and so I thought it was just time to give That's it. That's cool. Yeah, give it a little love on it. And, and also, Nmap is probably one of the uh, most featured application in movies. Yeah. Yes. Uh, pretty much in any movie, if you happen yes. to see source code on a screen... They that was probably Nmap. They have, uh, they have. If you, uh, you Google search Nmap in movies, the Nmap uh, project put a dedicated website up of all of the different times that Nmap and screenshots of. In fact, uh, I use I use the uh, Matrix one in my in depth look because yeah, it's a it's a very cool looking tool, and so they've documented it getting used in various uh, TV shows and movies or comic books even. Yeah, which is really neat. Um, all right, dude, should we move on to uh, the next news story? Sure. This is our last big one for the day. Yeah, and yes. then we'll jump into the roundup. All right, or actually, feedback. Uh, so this one comes from uh, from Verizon. Uh, yeah, so Verizon Business Consulting, which is oh. a consulting firm, uh, is part of Verizon, the company. Okay, uh, I was like, why is this these guys? Okay, that makes little sense. So yeah. they, boy, they just make money on all angles, don't they? Yeah. Uh, so they were hired to uh, analyze some of the fallout from the RSA compromise that we talked about way back in the very beginning of TechSnap. Yeah. Uh, and their basic conclusion is that most companies don't have to be too worried about it, but if you're a government, you should probably get your RSA tokens replaced and be vigilant about failed login attempts or successful login attempts and so, then, on and so on. Doesn't that kind of mean everybody should get their tokens replaced? Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly okay. what it means, but kind of seems uh, like... Like they don't want to come out and say RSA just RSA. screwed the pooch and they've got a fundamental issue now with their product. So they just said, but, you know, if you're government, you know, because you guys yeah. just like to double check. Yeah, if you're, if you're a government or a defense contractor or, you know, anybody that anybody would care about, you might want to uh, look at, at getting your RSA tokens replaced. This is interesting because uh, Google has a Google authentication open infrastructure that sort of, it's, it's not really a full-blown competitor to the RSA, but, you know, if you have lower grade needs, it can be. And their whole thing is uh, that anybody can write to it with an API system. And it seems like that's a better solution than one company that uh, you, know, you have to go to and you have to get a special license and get special handshakes and all that kind of stuff. Because now in this scenario, it's, if it's busted, it's just permanently busted. What are they, yeah, I mean, they have to replace uh, the, the little uh, fobs. Yeah. And uh, major screw-up. Has, has some issues there, obviously. 
Um, hmm. So, the typical attacks that they found uh, that happened against former or uh, RSA customers uh, were usually uh, email spear phishing. So, you know, you know this company had RSA tokens, so you grab all their email addresses and start sending them uh, spam with like you know trojans attached or whatever, right? Oh, of course. Uh, so they were trying to get uh, trojans and keyloggers onto the machines of people that use the secure ID tokens. Uh-huh. Uh, the objective there is to log the username and password and the temporary pin generated by the secure ID token. Now, the idea with the secure ID token is that pin doesn't work after five seconds. Right. Right. So now you have, but, but to log in, you have to have the username, the password, and the pin. So part of breaking in here is to get the username and password. Now, if you weren't using secure token, once they get your username and password, they're in. Uh, so the secure token is still doing something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but once they have a small number of these pins, uh, they can try uh, using information they stole from RSA. It's speculated that they can determine which RSA token you have and uh, generate a clone of it. And once once they have that, they can generate that pin number for when they want to try to log in. Aha! Uh -huh. Very clever. Very Allowing clever. Allowing them to compromise the target. Well. I, uh, it, it's not clear exactly how well it works. Uh, and also, you know, oh, okay. sure. RSA says that they shouldn't be able to determine to clone the tokens at ever, but it's hard to say. You know, the question uh, I would have there is, can you guys do it? Can you, can, <laughs> can you at RSA, can you do it? And if, yeah. they, if they say yes, which, come on, they must be mm -hmm. able to, then that means they can't, it can be done. Right. Uh, and then the unconfirmed list of companies that have been targeted uh, by these attacks include Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, uh, the International Monetary Fund, and uh, L3 Communications. Oh my gosh. Level 3 Communications is a massive, massive bandwidth backbone throughout the U.S. Uh, I, I mean, those are all huge names. Those are all big names. Yeah. There's not a single name there that's in, inconsequential. So it's, that's kind of incredible, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah. Alan, is there any other thoughts you have on that one? Um, we should mention, too, that links to all this and in sometimes you know in most cases like with the pdf exploit alan actually has links to the research papers the original cves yep. from 2009 and all this kind of stuff we have extensive show notes over jupiterbroadcasting.com and just look for uh, techsnap 40 and you can find them there yeah uh um, should we should we move on or anything uh, else you want to so cover our, the rsa uh, rsa continues to claim that the security of the security tokens has not been compromised right uh but after being subjected to a bunch of pressure by their customers they have agreed to replace the tokens for any customer who requests it. Okay, so... So, you know, if, if you're Northrop Grumman, you can be like, hey, RSA, uh, we'd feel much... We'd sleep much better at night if you would please uh, replace our RSA tokens. Hey, RSA, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, yeah. I bet, I bet. All right. Well, interesting story, and one that continues to get... Just has little bits of more detail added to it every single time. I mean, if you think about where this show originally started covering this story, and there was just a, a flat blanket denial coming from RSA, and now, about 40 episodes later, we're at the... Well, you know, if you want us to replace your token, we'll do it for free. Uh, we'll pay for the shipping, too. Um, really sorry about this. You know, it's like, it's a pretty but, big uh, shift. This is more... Uh if you bought a corporate level installation where you right, bought yeah. the, the off yeah. server and the box of a thousand keys. Yeah. The, they're not going to, uh, yeah. Like I mean, if, you have, if you have a key for PayPal or uh, or wow or something, it's PayPal or wow. That would have to decide to get your token replaced. Not the other mm -hmm. way around. Mm -hmm. uh, also to clarify L3 communications isn't uh, level three, the internet back. Oh, oh, okay. My uh, bad. L3 communications is a defense contractor that makes command and control communications, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance systems. Oh, that's, uh, uh, that's make, way like, worse. Avionics for airplanes and okay. so on. So that's worse. That's a lot worse than is what you're yeah. saying. That's, that's much worse than a bandwidth provider. <laughs> well, it depends who you are. Cause <laughs> I, I'm honestly slightly more worried about the bandwidth provider. But. Okay. True. True enough. I don't like the idea of them going after, uh, uh defense Either. stuff, but yeah. <laughs> All right, is there anything else you want to cover on that story? Uh, no, I think it's time. All right, then before we move on, let's say holler to our good friends over at GoDaddy.com who continue to be excellent supporters of TechSnap. And I want to remind you, too, that if you're on the go and you have your most brilliant idea, and you guys know what I'm saying, like if you get a really good domain name idea, you want to capitalize on it immediately because you don't sure. want it to pass. Like, I'll be honest, I just I, as soon as the idea of Conspiracy Bacon as a show name came up, bought it immediately 
So that way I know I can say it on air without worrying about somebody buying it right out from underneath me. And a great way to do that is through GoDaddy's mobile apps. They have free maps, free apps for uh, BlackBerry, Android, and of course they have them for the iPhone and iPad too, which is which is perfect when you're on the go and you're like, oh shoot, you know what? That is, oh, I gotta get it right now. Uh, so go check I've, those I've out. I've actually done that before. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And when I, you're, I was in a meeting and we were talking about an idea and the name was decided on and it was like, got it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. it is totally, dude. I have done that too. Yeah. Uh, when when you're shopping, if you buy, if you want to buy yourself a dot com or something like that, we got a few codes you can use to save some money. TechSnap10 yeah. will save you 10% off your order at checkout. So if you're doing a whole slew of things, that could save you some money. If you want to get some hostings, TechSnap20 that'll save you 20% on hosting plans. And uh, last but not least, if you want to get a domain a domain name for seven dollars and ninety nine cents, use our code TechSnap7. That's one of the best deals on the internet right there. And we also have a bunch of other codes that we'll list in the show notes. You can get all kinds of goodies in there. I'm looking over. Yeah. One of these things I really got to look into is they have these new virtual data center plans where I think you can actually get your hands on some it's, iron management. It's uh, similar to Amazon EC2. Yeah. And we've got... Get, uh, get a bunch of virtual machines, yeah. We've got TechSnap25, which gives you 25% off that. I want to play with that because that could be pretty interesting stuff. I think, yeah. I think there's something there to, to explore. Yeah. So uh, thanks to GoDaddy for supporting TechSnap, and thanks to all of you who support this show by using those codes when you check out over at GoDaddy.com. All right, Alan, with all of the news done, it's time for the TechSnap Feedback! And welcome to the TechSnap Feedback segment. Thank you for sending your questions to TechSnap at JupiterBroadcasting.com. Now, Alan, uh, one of our questions today came from EB, who's a longtime Jupiter Broadcasting viewer. And he wrote in a pretty simple question that I'm a little dumbfounded. We've never actually covered on the show before, especially for how much we bring it up. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to just go ahead and read it? Yes. All right, here it goes. So uh, he writes in, hey, guys, you talk about it a lot on the show, and it's one of the most common security vulnerabilities on the web. But what is a SQL injection? We do talk about it an awful lot, and it is yes. super common. And it uh, it's, probably, it's probably a pretty handy thing to have a good understanding of, Alan. So do you want to yes. take a shot at explaining it? Sure. So an SQL injection attack is uh, usually caused by careless coding uh, during the construction of an application uh, that in some way uses an SQL database. Uh, through some fault or other, the attacker is able to inject code into the SQL statement, and that's where SQL injection comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, so the most classic of this example uh, is you know, a very poor login script. Uh, so if you know a little bit about SQL, uh, you'd have a, a query, something like select uh, star, meaning every field, from users where username equals blah and password equals blah. Right, and under normal operations, this would work. Right, you log in with username, password, or username Alan, and password of something strong and, and unique. Uh, now, of course, this example is bad because they're not using password hashing, but let's ignore that for now. Uh, but what if someone uh, were to attempt to log in with the username such as Alan with a single quote after it and then a couple of dashes? Okay. Uh, well, when they do that. The, S the way the SQL statement actually gets read by the server is select star from users where username equals Alan, stop. And then a comment is started that has the rest of the query in it. So now it selects the row uh, for my user and returns it successfully. Now the login script is re expecting either the username and password match and it gets the row back or it gets nothing back, meaning that it was the wrong username and password. So now I've basically, by adding a uh, single quote after my name and a couple of dashes, I can now log in as any user uh, without a password at all. Aha. Uh -huh. So you've, uh, you've essentially tricked the system in a sense. Yes. So just by adding a single <clears throat> quote and, a, and two dashes after any username, I can log in as that user without needing their password. Uh, and so that's an SQL injection. In this case, all I injected was... A single quote. <laughs> right, right. And a couple of dashes, which uh, in SQL, dash, dash is the uh, comment indicator, right? Just like, you know, the pound sign is for bash scripts and, and things like that. But could you just as easily include like a drop table command or? Yes. Uh, so in the second example is instead of uh, a username, I just put single quote semicolon. So 
uh, that makes the query select star from users where username equals quote quote meaning blank, uh, and then drop table users, therefore deleting the table of users and all the users are gone, <laughs> uh, and then the comment symbol dash dash and for the rest of whatever's left in the query so you don't get an error. And now that'll find zero users because there's no user with the username of blank, uh, but then it will delete the entire user table. Right, and this this leads to the classic XKCD comic about little bobby tables uh in the comic the parents named their kid uh with his middle name being an sql injection attack so that you know when the government puts them in a database or when the school puts them in a database it deletes their database i love that i love that i've also so i just i'm showing that comic right now mm -hmm. which is great uh li yeah little uh, little robert uh, <laughs> little robert drop table <laughs> Yeah, and there's also I don't know if you've seen this, Alan. There's this guy who put it on the front of his bumper sticker because you know uh, it look, this yeah. looks like a license plate from from the UK or Europe. Europe. Yeah, yep. and uh, it, he's got it so when it takes a picture, the police database uh, servers will read that and then enter it in the database and drop the table too, which is yeah. which is great. <laughs> uh, yes, so this is why it's important Poland, to sanitize your inputs. Uh, right, so by when you sanitize your inputs, you're uh, removing or escaping any characters that have special meaning, uh, so that they don't get interpreted. In this case, that single quote mark is ending the parameter that's supposed to be your username. Mm. If you escape those quote marks, uh, then they're treated as literal quote marks rather than having the special meaning, uh, and so it would look for a username of Alan quote mark dash dash instead of a username of Alan, and then interpreting the rest of that as code. Uh, so each programming language provides different ways to do this, uh, but amateurs or sloppy coders often forget or miss cases where that input uh, mm -hmm. gets executed without being sanitized. Mm -hmm. Part of it might be that it gets passed through a bunch of stuff before it gets to where it's used, and so once it gets there, you know, you think that it was sanitized already previously, but maybe it wasn't or whatever. Right, right, okay. And and or some change, it was sanitized, but somebody made a change somewhere. And they accidentally removed it or something, and and you know, there's lots of different <laughs> yeah. ways it can happen, especially on big uh, projects like yeah. Microsoft SQL Server. Yeah. Uh, now PHP, for example, provides a number of different methods for sanitizing the inputs, and I've linked uh, the PHP manual. Actually, has an entire page about SQL injection, which also includes a bunch of really cool examples. Uh, they even show some for other SQL servers, uh, like Postgres. And one of their statements, uh, they were doing one, uh, a basic one if. Uh, you're doing an SQL query for returning your articles in pages of like, say, 25 at a time, right? Okay. So that you can page through the content. And you're taking that which page number to show as a parameter from the user. Sure, yeah. And so what they did is they said page zero, semicolon, and then the SQL statement to add a new user as root to the server. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and then you can just connect directly to the server as root and do whatever you want to do. Now, would that still work if they didn't have the database running, the database, the user running the database server, if it wasn't an administrator, would that still work? Would it yeah. still have the yeah. rights to do that? Yes. And so you should never run SQL queries as root, except for as an admin, when you're administering the server. Uh, your applications, like code you're running in PHP, should never run as root. Right. Yeah. So if they had a, if they had a specific user that had limited rights and abilities, but then would that if, be less? If, if it was, say, WordPress, uh -huh. you could add a new WordPress administrator that way. Which is still just as destructive, in really. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so mm. there's a, a function in PHP called MySQL Escape String, uh, which will basically add the um, backslashes in front of things like uh, single quotes so that they lose their special meaning. Okay. Uh, but it doesn't consider the character set and the encoding and stuff like that. And so it has actually been deprecated by PHP, and you should actually use MySQL real escape string. The difference here is that it connects to MySQL and uses MySQL's built-in function for escaping, ah. uh, which is better. And so it, while it requires an active connection to a MySQL server, uh, but you need that anyway if you're going to run a query on the SQL server, mm -hmm. um, then it takes the character set the database settings, and the server configuration into consideration when it's deciding what needs to be escaped. Hmm, okay. That's pretty because intelligent. You can do things like change what the uh, escape character, or the uh, uh, comment characters are. And if you do that, then the built-in PHP uh, escaping function doesn't know that and doesn't escape it properly. Sure. Okay. Uh, the other thing you can do, uh, I've seen a bunch of people in the chat room recommend this, is use prepared statements. 
uh, which is also called parameterization. So basically what you do is you write the SQL query with variables in it, and then you bind that, and what it does is it prepares that statement to be run multiple times with different sets of those variables, hmm. and then you plug in those variables after using these bind statements. And during that process, they get escaped for you by the SQL server properly. Oh. Uh, so it allows you to, to write it much cleaner without having to put all these you know, extra escape code in the middle where you're constructing the query as a string and then executing it. Yeah. You construct, construct it with the variables and then do substitution after. Uh, and that's generally the better way to do it. Okay. <clears throat> so what it comes down I to... I included uh, uh, links to more in-depth explanations of how all of that works uh, in the show notes. So what it comes down to is SQL injections are generally the end result of some bad coding done somewhere. So yeah. somebody not doing good, like code hygiene, essentially. Yeah. That's why they always, that's why Alan and I will always sit here and kind of smirk a little bit when you hear about like a site like mysql.com being brought down due to SQL injections. Because it's like, yes. really guys, you, you should know how to code better. <laughs> you should be able to do a better job at this kind of thing. Because <laughs> it's always just human error at the end of the day with SQL injections. Well, EB, that was a great question. And if there's other things out there... Uh, that kind of echo those types of things that we maybe talked about in the show, but you've lacked an understanding and would like us to explain, send them in, techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Yes, like, for example, uh, some, a bunch of people in the chat room are asking about cross-site scripting injection. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's something we can talk about some week. Yeah, all right. We see, if we see an, yeah, if we see an interesting, uh, or we see some people asking about that, let's definitely do it, because uh, there's an interest. I'd love to cover that. And even the stuff that I kind of have a pretty good idea about, it's always good to get a refresher on. You know, that mm-hmm. helps, too. So, all right. Alan, anything else in that before we move on? Nope, that's that's it. All I have. All right, then you know what that means. It's time for the Tech Snap Roundup. And that music means it's time for the Tech Snap Roundup. And the Roundup are the stories that didn't quite make into the main news section of the story, but A, we still thought were great, and B, we want to give you links to so you can go to a little further reading. We go painstakingly into detail on the big news stories. These are ones that we go a little quicker through, a little faster. And Alan, our first batch of stories in the roundup this week are all completely related. And it's a boys and interesting because they all started with massively attention-grabbing headlines. It's, it's like a security blog's best case scenario. First of all, a, a, a massive headline comes out and says, boom. Semantic has been hacked, source code leaked. And then uh, almost right on the heels of that, based on code from Symantec, India has coerced Apple and RIM into providing backdoors into their devices to sell throughout the India market. And then another headline after that, U.S. announces investigation into Apple and RIM over black backdoor practices. I mean, it was one heck yeah. of a series of headlines we watched this week. Well, specifically, uh, the U.S. investigation was sparked by claims that the Indian government was using it to spy on U.S. diplomats, blackberries. Right. Yeah, of course, they don't like that very much. But it, isn't it actually looking like it's turning out uh, that an up-and-coming hacker group is trying to get attention for themselves, so they're kind of going after the grabby headline thing? Uh, a little bit. It's unclear on what everything is. But obviously, Apple, Nokia, and RIM claim that they are not giving back doors to uh, India, although we've seen that they've made certain... Uh, Allowances? Allowances to uh, other countries before, like Saudi Arabia mm-hmm. and so on. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's hard to say exactly. Well, and, and actually, how Apple's ex- exact uh, rebuttal was um, uh, Apple does not uh, provide backdoor access or something like that. It was kind of funny. But mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that they don't just give them an upset front of set of keys and say, here, go through the front door. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? I mean, it was kind of funny. And Nokia's response, because Nokia was lumped into this too, Nokia's response was, is, uh, Nokia, follows, uh, Nokia takes the privacy of its customers very seriously and follows all applicable laws in the nations where we sell. So A, their now, customers it- are the carriers, and B, follows all applicable laws makes me think that if they put a law in the books that says you put a back door in there, they put a back door in there. Exactly. So I didn't like that answer very much. <laughs> no. Although it is a fairly boilerplate answer. Uh, yeah. Because, yeah. you know, in, in, mo- in some countries, I guess there aren't any countries left that don't have evil laws like that anymore uh, that allow the government to spy on you legally. But, but it, does, it does look like the, uh, the big story about the backdoor thing might be, might be a fake. Uh, the Lords uh, of Dahamahara, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but that's the name of the new up-and-coming hacking group who's trying to get their name out there. Essentially, well, they, and also they seem to be just pushing their political message that the Indian government is spying on its citizens and so on. Right, right. And, you know, same thing happens everywhere, right? Y- yeah, Because governments do spy on their citizens. 
If you uh, don't believe so, you're delusional. Our next story in the roundup is actually kind of plays into that. Of course, it's a SOPA story, and that's about government control and, and industry control over uh, the Internet. Reddit has become this massive place of Internet activism. It's, it's amazing to watch. And in sort of embracing that, Reddit on their official blog has announced that they will do uh, a blackout next week, Wednesday of next week. So uh, when TechSnap comes back on the air next week, it'll, that'll just wrapped up. So that'll yep. be kind of exciting. I'm sure we'll talk about that in the show. But yeah, they're shutting, they're shutting the site down on January 18th from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in protest of SOPA. Yep. Now, we've heard discussions uh, or talk before that other sites might join in on this, and uh, including, you know, uh, sites as big as Amazon and Google have, and Facebook have threatened to do this because they're I don't buy it. I, just I don't, don't, I don't see it. Facebook shutting down for Or, uh, or Amazon. Hours. Amazon claims when they're down for a minute, yeah. it can cost them a million dollars. Right. Uh, yes. And uh, Amazon may be actually less affected by SOPA than other places. But somewhere like Facebook, if, if they're really serious about stopping SOPA, then that's what they have to do. It's the yeah. only way to get, you know, regular people that play Farmville to call the congressman. Yeah, because Reddit will be, a, I mean, it's a big audience. It's like, what are they, are unique? It's like a 20 million a month or something like that. But it is a limited right, audience. But it also, the audience is almost all already on side with them. Right. It's right. preaching to the choir. I would like to see Reddit sort of take this opportunity and kick it up to the next notch and raise awareness about things like Protect IP and ACTA because yeah. uh, and, and the Internet ID that's that uh, President Obama has announced that their staff is working on. Because these the, the, what I'm worried a little bit with Reddit doing this is a little bit of the blowing the collective wad of people getting all excited to go to battle to fight this. And then we fight it and we defeat SOPA. And then I'm worried people are just going to tune out again. while. The funny thing is, is Protect IP may actually be the it's bigger threat. Just, it's literally a, a, a hyped up version of, of SOPA. Actually, well, it's, and it as, existed before SOPA and will exist after. As the EFF pointed yep. out, I started tracking, what's funny is I started ta tracking Protect IP before SOPA really showed up on our radars. Yeah, we talked about this ages ago. Yeah, and I think Protect IP is the actual bill they want to get through. And, and as the EFF has pointed out on their website, the scary thing about the Protect IP Act is it's not stuck in committee like SOPA is, right? right. SOPA has to get out of committee before it can even go to vote. Protect IP is already being sent to the floor of the Senate for vote. It's not in committee. It's already going out, and probably next week or the week after this, after that, it'll be voted on. Yeah. It, it could be made and law. it's mostly the same crap. <laughs> it actually, uh, it, it, it Protect and IP it actually has some elements of it that I don't like even more than SOPA. Like, uh, it makes linking, not, not hosting, but linking to DRM removing tools, uh, a, an illegal act that can get your website pulling off. And, yeah. you know, I've had uh, old and vendor applications that I've had to remove DRM on because the vendor just doesn't even exist anymore. Yeah, and so there's and, legitimate and, uses for some of that stuff. Yes, and that's you know the Digital Millennium Copyright Act had provisions for that, uh, right? They actually had a provision where librarians from the Library of Congress would actually get to decide uh, when something was no longer subject to it. But these newer acts, they're like, no, we we don't want any recourse at all. We're just going to screw everybody because we're getting paid to do so. So the and the other thing that's extremely scary and has been been it's been worked on since 2008 and that's actually when the F, the free free uh, free software foundation came out against it ACTA is a proposed enforcement treaty between the United States the European European uh, communities Switzerland Japan Australia the Republic of Korea New Zealand Mexico and Canada which is a essentially a global anti counterfeiting trade agreement that would make copyright infringements a global crime I mean. We're right. talking, this is getting and, to a and massive I love how they scale. try to, to mask it as uh, anti-counterfeiting. Because, sure, people are against counterfeit drugs, and they can advertise it as that. But it has nothing to do with... Right. ACTA is, is so scary because, A, it's being done completely... In, it's, this, it's this worldwide agreement being done in total secrecy. Yeah. In fact, I don't know if you saw this story, Alan, but one of the first drafts was sent to a Canadian college that said, hey, this is what your network needs to adhere by, according to the ACTA standards. Mm -hmm. The only thing that wasn't blanked out on the agreement was the signature line and the name ACTA. And they had every, everything else had been blanked out due to confidentiality reasons, but they still, had to, they still wanted them to agree to the agreement. I mean, it's that level of secrecy and, yep. and hidden moving around in the, in the behind the scenes stuff that they're doing. I guess my point is here is SOPA is the first battle in a war. And I want, I want people like on Reddit and the rest of the internet to not focus so much just on SOPA alone, but the fact that our whole online rights are going to be under attack for a while now. 
Yep. I mean, look what happened in Spain, right? They had that SOPA wannabe bill a year ago, which failed. And now here we are again, uh, one year later, and, the, and Spain is, is, is introducing it again. Yeah, well, in Canada, they've, they've tried to introduce uh, a law similar to the DMCA almost uh, every other year for ages now, since yeah. these states passed the DMCA, because, mostly because they've been under pressure by the U.S. government to do so uh, or face trade sanctions. I mean, I think both you and I are under the belief that Protect IP and SOPA, the, the U.S. government and other governments around the world will never give up. They will never stop because they, they, need to, they want to pass something like this. To, to care. The, the, internet, uh, the, the internet is a great way to distribute uh, an old media model's uh, content, which doesn't hold up when you, anybody can connect anything or anybody can share anything effortlessly because it's just bits. And yep. uh, the internet is also a great place to become self-educated on topics that governments don't want you to become self-educated on. So there's, it's not just copyright, it's not just the pharmaceuticals, but the governments themselves have an interest in being able to take things down. I just yes, don't see any reason why they'll stop. So we have to be prepared for a massive fight. More of it is the fight. fact that they don't understand how the internet works, and they're trying to meddle with it anyway. And, well, but at this and point, they obviously just don't care either. Exactly. They don't, they don't want to learn how the internet works. They want to get reelected. I mean, I and get it. To it's, do it's, so, they don't care what, who votes for them. They're more worried about getting enough campaign financing to convince regular people that don't know any better to vote for them via TV commercial. And I don't know if I believe that they don't get it, because, I mean, it's cute to say computers are hard, and I don't understand how the internet works. It's a series of tubes. Yes, but, but the reality is, don't though, understand DNS. the reality is, though, the internet is becoming just as important to the economy as the freeway and interstate system is. So it's almost yes. like not understanding how the freeway and internet system, internet, Interstate but it's, works. It's more like they don't understand. They don't understand how what the changes they want to make, how they're going to affect DNS and security, and how it's all related and it's yeah. all going to break everything. And they just charge ahead anyway. So uh, I I commend Reddit for doing this because they get a massive amount of traffic. So undoubtedly they'll get a lot of exposure for doing that. I hope that they very and it sounds like they have plans to, but I just hope that they heavily push on protect IP because we could find in the next few weeks. We, by the end of January, it will be voted on. It's, it's, yep. it's slated to be before the end of January. That is coming up, people. And, and mm -hmm. SOPA is still in committee. So people yep. really have to focus on Protect IP and the other things that are coming down the road. Including, at some point, we'll probably have to, on this show, address uh, President Obama's inter national internet ID thing that he wants to do. Right. That was a subject that I had some coverage on in like the first or second episode of TechSnap, and it kept getting bumped because I wanted to get even more coverage on it. Mm -hmm. And it eventually kind of slipped out of the... Well, the White, House, the White House just announced that in, in the next few weeks, they'll be revealing their big plan. So we should have something yeah. soon on that. But and, they, you know, the goal of the plan isn't necessarily evil. Uh, the idea is that with uh, a more durable ID, you can prevent a lot of things like credit card fraud. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, it has side effects. And if they're not addressed properly, it becomes a bigger issue rather than solving the issue. All right, should we move on to the next story in the roundup? It's sort of like a, uh, a public uh, service announcement. There's been six security flaws identified in OpenSSL. So if you use OpenSSL, which probably a lot of you do, uh, go check Pretty for your much updates. Pretty everything does. Yeah. <laughs> if you're on the internet, you probably use OpenSSL. <laughs> yes. So uh, they, they have, and you know, honestly, this is just one of those kind of infrastructure things that you just got to keep patched because if, you're, if you got holes at this level, then you're just all kinds of screwed. Alan, do you want to talk about the uh, Stratfor guys? And, uh... Just a little bit. Uh, so Stratfor uh, has finally relaunched their website uh, with the new web design after uh, their website has been completely offline uh, since we covered a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. uh, when they were targeted by a group claiming to be anonymous. I don't know if that was ever sorted out, whether anonymous was for or against it. Um, but you know, uh, their customer database was taken, uh, about apparently 200 gigabytes of data, all their emails, everything was compromised. And so uh, they have just now finally relaunched their website. Yay, good for them, I guess. <laughs> so yeah. uh, I've actually heard they're still being targeted for further attacks, but we'll see. Yep. Uh, <laughs> well, when you, when you get all their emails and stuff, you get so much information that you can, mm -hmm. can continue to exploit for, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, it's just... I don't know that there's anything they could do about it. Speaking of SSL bug fixes, though, Microsoft has released the Beast SSL bug fix on uh, January's Patch Tuesday. Da -da -da -da. Yeah, uh, now I think one of these is actually the same flaw that's being fixed in OpenSSL. Probably, huh? Uh, uh, but yes, uh, this is something we talked about yeah, way, here. Way, way back on uh, TechSnap24. 
Oh, okay. Uh, so that would have been basically like 24 episodes ago. Yeah, it says here in the article it's not specific to Windows, but of course Microsoft has to right. issue their own patch for it. For yes, their and so did OpenSSL and so yeah. on. Uh, so now this is one that was around for quite a while, but uh, apparently took a while to fix and so on. So, uh, oh, go ahead. So with this Beast SSL attack allowed the attackers to actually uh, decrypt transactions over SSL and eventually, mm -hmm. uh, in the example, get back a PayPal cookie, which they could then authenticate themselves with and uh, basically take over your, S your SSL session to PayPal, PayPal. and oh. start transacting as you. That's scary. That's scary. Now, it required a man-in-the-middle attack and a bunch of other things, but as we've talked about before, those are actually possible, especially if you're using Wi-Fi mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so on. Yeah, yeah. I always picture, my, my first thought is always the coffee shop. Yep. Uh, somebody there at the coffee shop may be going to refill their PayPal card so they can make a purchase or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to talk about this new SEC guidance that may impact the corporate yes. disclosures? Now, uh, as we've talked about on TechSnap before, yeah. uh, the, we, uh, we talked about the SEC, the uh, Securities Exchange Commission, uh, which governs the stock markets, mm -hmm. uh, had talked about asking companies to be more forthcoming and possibly having to include very detailed information about uh, cybersecurity incidents uh, on In, their financial disclosures, their yearly financial disclosures. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so now they've actually published a set of guidelines. It's not actually a law yet, but it's a set of guidelines of, of how corporations should handle uh, disclosing their cybersecurity incidents. Interesting to see that EMC because, has been pointed out as uh, being reluctant yes. towards doing this. And so right. you, you so wonder, you wonder EMC, if maybe... Yeah, oh, EMC is the parent company to RSA. Yeah. And basically in their filings, they said that the incident will have no impact on our business. Right. But what it really is, if you're a company like RSA and you've had some uh, breach that's Massive fundamentally... Breach that, that to like, well, they're going to lose some money just on the fact that they have to replace all the RSA tokens. But if you had to disclose that somebody got the fundamental, the, the fundamental secret sauce to the way your security implementation works, that's going to mess with your financials. And that, there's, there's, that's yeah. obviously why they don't want to disclose that kind of stuff. Yes, because it will hurt their stock price. And, but and, like, shouldn't investors know that that's been cracked and that it might exactly. not be a long-term good, viable investment? Yes, and that is why the SEC is saying that you know, they have to start disclosing this stuff. And just because the government is slow moving and the stock market and the companies are resistive and these reports only come out once a year or whatever, uh, it seems like it'll be a phased-in thing. And yeah. so it's starting off with a recommendation on how it should be handled. Yeah. And they'll let it settle and see how people react to it. And, and eventually a standard will come up with how this kind of stuff should be reported. Yeah. And we'll see. We'll see if people actually start. Until it becomes a law, though, you got to figure most companies are just going to avoid the hassle and the cost of trying to do it. Well, basically, this is a, a premonition, uh, not a premonition, but just a an preview. indicator that... A uh, that the law is coming and so that companies should start thinking about how they're going to do this. Right, and have a chance to lobby against it. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> yeah. Alan, I think that's brought us to the end of the show. Yep, that's all I got. Man, that was a big one this week. Well, everyone, so here's the, here's the little itty-bitty details you need to know about if you want to watch us live. Go over to jblive.tv at 1 p.m. Pacific. Alan, East Coast time? Uh, 4 p.m. 4 p.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv where you can no, join our chat room. And uh, tell us what's up. What? What? You said 4 p.m. Pacific. Oh, Eastern. 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, yeah, 1 p.m. Pacific, See, 4 p.m. Eastern, or uh, 2100 UTC. I like that. See, I think everybody should just go by UTC because time yeah. is all just an imaginary construct, at least the way we label it. Anyway, I, saw, I don't feel like I should have to follow it. It's, yeah. it's just as made up as anything else. So, did, I think, did we talk about that on TechSnap or did I not promote that story? I had what? one about replacing time with, it was based on UTC, but it also had a couple other changes. Oh, it was going to get rid of uh, leap years and... Um, yeah. Dude, I'm else? down with that. It was going to get rid that. of like, everything and uh, make almost all the months have the same number of days because why do we have like 28 and 31 and 30? And... Maybe, uh, maybe when the internet takes over and eliminates right, all nation sorry, borders. It was going to make Christmas be on a Saturday every year. Oh, that's see, see, okay. So, so, so you get the rid calendar of the, would be the same every single year, oh right? My January first would always be like a Monday or whatever. Can I just propose that when the internet dissolves all nation borders, that we just adopt that as our internet-wide time? The chat room, see, the chat room loves it. They, they think that's great, and it would be so much easier. So, 
Yeah. All right, everyone. Also, uh, TechSnap is released for download on Fridays over at jupiterbroadcasting.com, and we put it in like every format you could want for mobile devices, audio only for commuting, HD for whatever, you know, HD if you want to see the pores in our skin, which always mm-hmm. look amazing. And all kinds of stuff. And also you'll find the RSS feeds where you can sc- subscribe and get this show weekly. Yeah. All right, Alan. Well, good show. Thanks, man. Yes. Okay, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning to this week's episode of TechSnap. And we'll see you right back here next week. 